Hello everyone, I'm your professor Dave Cacciarella. This is an introduction to Earth Science from the textbook Foundations of Earth Science, the 8th edition. Of course, brought to you by Pearson Education, written by Lutkins and Tarbuck. We are in Chapter 6, The Restless Earth, Earthquakes and Mountain Building. And of course, this is an extension of what we talked about in Plate Tectonics, the grand unifying theory of geology. And virtually everything, including earthquakes and mountain building, can be explained in geology when you consider the theory of plate tectonics. So let's get started with chapter six. This chapter starts with the question, what is an earthquake? Well, an earthquake is simply the sudden movement of one block of rock slipping past another along a fracture. So in that situation, we have these two blocks, and let's just say this block on the left is being moved because of tectonics. Let's just say it's on one plate that's moving to the south and moving for the bottom of this page, and this other block here to the right is moving to the top of this page. Well, the frictional forces between those two blocks will cause them to be locked. They won't move, even though there's pressure going in two different directions. They won't move. But eventually, the pressure will overcome the frictional forces, and the rocks will slip very suddenly past one another. And that slip is the earthquake. And of course, when that slip occurs, seismic waves will radiate away from what is known as the hypocenter or uh, more often referred to as the focus. And the focus has, happens somewhere along the fault line. It may happen very close to the surface, but it also may happen very, very deep down beneath the surface. The bottom line is that is the focus of the earthquake. The epicenter that we hear so much about in the media is directly above the focus on the surface of the earth. Here are our two slabs of rocks. Again, there's a pre-existing fault, that little red line there. One slab is moving to the north. The other slab is moving to the south. Here's our time frame, maybe tens to hundreds of years from the point at which uh, we had the last earthquake and then pressure, transformed pressure, one moving north, one moving south, but friction all along the fault. So for that tens to hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, the friction along that fault holds those two blocks right next to each other, even though one's being pushed north and one's being pushed south. And so those rocks on either side of the fault begin to deform. And it's much like taking a pencil, or you might even want to think about a rubber band, and with the pencil beginning to bend it or the rubber band beginning to stretch it. And that, that deformation of both the pencil, it begins to bend, the rubber band begins to stretch, it builds and it builds and it builds. And then once the frictional resistance is exceeded, the slippage occurs. And when that slippage occurs, it's very important to understand that this is the original shape of the rock. That's the original shape of that block of rock. The two blocks of rock go back to their original shape. They've just moved. And that is the earthquake. And this whole process is referred to as elastic rebound. So Weak earthquakes can be generated by volcanoes, landslides, perhaps even um, meteorite impacts, but larger, more destructive earthquakes are going to occur because of tectonic forces. The pressure is built up by tectonic force. Friction keeps the fault together. Slip initiates when stress overcomes the friction. And the elastic rebound is the rock going from this place to being deformed and misshapen to snapping back to its original shape, and it's that snap back that is the earthquake. So convergent plate boundaries generate compressional forces, and of course this is a big part of earthquakes. It's also going to be a big part of mountain building. Uh, and, uh, and so mountain building and faulting associated with large earthquakes all has to do with these convergent plate boundaries. Here's an oceanic lithospheric plate, all right, that's the light gray and this dark gray, that's the oceanic crust, oceanic uh, upper mantle, this is the oceanic lithospheric plate. This is the continental crust, the continental upper level of the mantle. So this is the continental lithospheric plate. And the oceanic plate is moving in this direction. The continental plate is moving in that direction. Continental plate is made largely of granitic rock. This is made mostly of basaltic rock. The density of this plate is not only higher, it's more dense, it's heavier than the, than the continental plate, but it's also slightly higher than the, the asthenosphere below it. And so this plate very easily slides down into the asthenosphere and is actually pulled down by gravity. At about 100 kilometers or so, 
uh, water begins to be forced out of this plate, water and other volatile liquids that causes partial melting of the mantle and to some degree you may get partial melting of the crust, but partial melting of this upper mantle uh, and that creates magma that rises up that either gets to the surface of the volcano, not all that often does that happen, but mostly rises up and creates these plutonic uh, types of uh, emplacements, these granitic emplacements. And again, that's mountain building, but you have to understand that this whole line between the continental lithospheric plate and the oceanic lithospheric plate, this whole line, this whole red line represents a fault and it's called the mega thrust fault. And that is the fault line between our continental lithosphere and our oceanic lithosphere. And the two are moving against each other. The continental is moving in this direction. The oceanic is moving in this direction. And anywhere along that fault, you can have slippage that can occur. It doesn't occur along, it does not occur along the entire fault. It can occur at individual spots and then move up and down the fault. So it can happen very shallow, or it can also happen really quite deep with some very powerful uh, faults that can occur. So that is what the compressional forces of a convergent plate boundary have to do with earthquakes and mountain building. They create earthquakes because it creates that mega thrust fault. And of course, the partial melting of the mantle helps to increase uh, the, the granitic composition and basically helps thicken the crust. The transform fault essentially occurs with a transform plate boundary, two boundaries moving past one another, one moving north, one moving south. That's the San Andreas Fault. It extends all the way down into the Gulf of California, all the way up into the Pacific Ocean. And quite literally, as these two plates are moving by each other, this chunk of, of continental crust, Los Angeles and even parts of San Francisco and Central and Northern California, could move away from the rest of California over, of course, hundreds of thousands and millions of years. So let's talk about the actual fault. Lots of distinct segments. Some segments displace very slowly, not a lot of uh, snapping movement. And so with that, you get, uh, you tend to get what they call fault creep. Some segments produce lots of teeny tiny earthquakes that are negligible, maybe not even being felt. And then some segments are locked, like the earthquake we showed you in the previous slides. They're locked together. And when they release, when the frictional forces are overcome, they release with very large earthquakes. These earthquakes uh, tend to occur in fairly repetitive cycles and essentially you can, you can see one area have an earthquake and then a set time frame longer than you'll begin to get into a, a period when you'll expect that same area to have another similar type of earthquake. Seismology is the study of earthquake waves. Again, we said that when an earthquake occurs, seismic waves radiate out in all directions from the focus and those waves, there's a number of different types of waves and the study of those waves are very important to understanding earthquakes and also understanding a lot of different things about the interior of the earth. Waves are measured, as you might know, by seism uh, seismometers and essentially uh, this little seismometer has a rolling spool. You can see over here the, the real picture, it's a gigantic a rolling spool and it just continues almost constantly uh, to move along. The actual device that has the ink on it is, is, uh, tends to be fixed and the rest of it is sort of attached to bedrock and it will shake back and forth and uh, cause those seismographs uh, that we hear about. And yes, uh, that is where we get our scales that we're going to talk about in a couple of moments. There are two main types of seismic waves. There are surface waves that literally travel along the surface of the Earth and there are body waves that travel through the Earth's interior. The surface waves, there's two different types of them, and then the body waves, there are two different types of them. And this is a, a hypocenter or the focus of an earthquake. The epicenter, of course, will be up on the surface, just directly above it. And when that earthquake occurs, seismic waves radiate in all directions, and the surface waves are gonna move along the surface. And then the body waves, two different types, the P wave and the S wave were primary and secondary. The P waves can move the most quickly. Uh, the S wave is a little bit slower and then the surface waves are actually quite a bit slower. So this first seismograph here, let's say I'm gonna call this 4,000 miles away from the actual epicenter, that seismograph. Uh, 
First the P wave arrives, then the S wave arrives, and then a little while later the surface wave arrives. But as you extend away from the hypocenter, the focus, the epicenter, it takes a little bit longer. Again, uh, you have the P wave arriving first at seismograph number two. It took longer than at seismograph number one. And then the, the distance between the first P wave and the second P wave, that time lag increases, as does the time lag between the S wave and the surface waves. You can see the surface waves do not have nearly as high an amplitude. It's got a little bit smaller. And then as you get a whole lot further away, uh, that P wave is uh, much, much smaller, and so are the other waves. And there's a much longer time lag between the arrival of the P, the S, and then the surface waves. So as I said, there are two primary types of body waves, primary or P waves, and secondary or S waves. Very important differences between the two. Uh, P waves have push and pull. It's like a slinky. It compresses and it expands, and it compresses and it expands, and it actually temporarily, very instantaneously, changes the volume of the material. And because it changes the volume of the material, primary waves, or those compressional waves, can travel through solids, liquids, and gases. It's very much like sound waves, the way a drum, you hit a drum and it compresses the air, and that's the sound that comes away from the drum. So, of course, sound goes through solids, liquids, and gases. But the secondary wave is not compressional. It's a shear wave. It's more like back and forth, or you could even think of it as up and down, but it does not change the volume of the material. It changes the shape of the material, and that type of wave does not travel through liquids or gases. So it won't travel through the Earth's core, which is, again, one of the primary ways we learn that the Earth's outer core is liquid because those secondary waves, there would be a shadow. They wouldn't travel through that part of it. So here are your P waves where the compression is parallel to the actual movement of the wave, and then your secondary waves or your shear waves where the compression, so the wave direction is in this direction, but the actual movement is, is at a right angle to that wave motion. There are also two types of surface waves. Um, some roll the earth like an ocean, and then some cause the earth to slide back and forth. Um, and you, you tend to have most of the damage that comes from seismic waves coming from these surface waves. So they travel along the surface of the Earth like a rolling ocean. That's one type of surface wave. And then the others move the material side to side. And they tend to be the most damaging, those that move the material side to side. So the speed of travel is very different for each type of wave, as I said. Uh, here's the first P wave, the first S wave, and then the surface waves. And that time interval is very important because imagine two cars starting out in Los Angeles driving on Interstate 10. One car is going to travel at 100 miles per hour, the other car is going to travel at 50. Well, we know the first car is going to get there first, but the distance between them is going to increase. When they get to El Paso, the distance between them might be uh, 100 miles. When they get to Houston, the distance between them might be 250 miles. By the time they get all the way over to Florida, to Tallahassee, the distance between them might be more like 500 miles. So the further a seismograph is away from the epicenter, or actually the focus, the larger this time interval is going to be. And that is the key to how we determine where earthquakes occur using seismographs. So as we said, earthquakes are associated with plate boundaries. About 95% of those um, earthquakes are, occur in the circum-Pacific belt and convergent plate boundaries. So the convergent plate boundaries of the world basically generate about 95% of the earth, earthquakes, those mega thrust faults I showed you a few minutes ago. There's also earthquakes along the convergent boundaries of the Alpine Himalayan belt. There's some weaker earthquakes along the oceanic ridge system because of tension. Don't forget the oceanic ridges are diverging plate boundaries, and so tension creates some earthquakes. And transform and strike slip faults can generate those large cyclical earthquakes, earthquakes that happen on a fairly frequent time frame in generally the same location. So this is the Circum Pacific Belt. Uh, because the same type of processes, that is convergent plate boundaries, create volcanoes as well. This is also sometimes called the Ring of Fire. But what I want you to look at is this, uh, the distribution of these earthquakes. Where the Nazca plate, so here's the East Pacific rise, where the Nazca plate goes, this right here, this plate outline right here, goes underneath the South American plate, 
you get a great deal of earthquakes in that subduction zone. The San Andreas Fault, this linear fault right through here, you get a lot of those transform plate boundary earthquakes. And then here is another subduction zone where the, the Pacific plate, is, the North American plate goes all the way over here. The Pacific plate is going underneath the North American plate. The Pacific plate is going underneath the Asian plate. Here the Pacific plate is going underneath the Australian plate. And so you get a tremendous number of plate boundaries that are convergent or compressional plate boundaries around the Pacific and a whole bunch of earthquakes. And then the Himalayas, you have the African plate is moving north. Of course, the Indian plate um, is moving north into Eurasia. That creates that Alpine Himalaya belt. Um, but you also have the tensional earthquakes, those earthquakes caused by the mid-Atlantic ridge pulling apart. You get some small earthquakes there as well. And then along some of those transform boundaries, you'll have earthquakes that occur also. You don't have nearly as many earthquakes on the east side of the Rockies as we do have west of the Rockies, but there's, there's been some. And sometimes they are a function of old plate boundaries. The, the, uh, we have an old plate boundary that occurs from when Pangaea actually came together, which is inland along the east coast. That creates some earthquakes. Um, and they're not very frequent in the central and eastern U.S., but they do produce large areas of structural damage. And that's because that underlying bedrock is much older and it's much more rigid. So the waves tend to travel at greater distances. And they're called intraplate earthquakes because they occur away from plate boundaries. All right, so I, I talked about the time interval uh, with seismographs as a means by which to locate an earthquake. P waves travel faster than S waves. The difference in time um, is exaggerated by distance. So regardless of where the, the, the focus is, this is the time interval by the time it got to Alaska, but further away, no, I'm sorry, by the time it got to New York, further away, Alaska, it's a larger time interval, and then closer, Mexico City, it's a shorter time interval. And so you can use these time intervals to A, judge the distance between Mexico City and the epicenter, and then when you know the distance from Mexico City to the epicenter, Nome, Alaska to the epicenter, New York, New York to the epicenter, then you can draw circles with New York being at the center of the circle, the distance being the radius of the circle, and where those three circles intersect, that is where you'll know where the epicenter of the earthquake lies. So using the standard travel time graph, meaning this is the graph for S curves and P curves, it has the y-axis, shows the time since the earthquake occurred, down here at zero, that's when the earthquake occurred, and that's time in minutes. And the x-axis is the distance of the P wave, which travels fastest, and then the S wave, which travels slowest. So it is going to take, it's gonna take 11 minutes for it to travel uh, some 36, 3,700 kilometers. So the key piece of information here is going to be that that lag between the P wave and the S wave, because that lag will get bigger and bigger and bigger the further you are away from the epicenter of the earthquake. So when we're looking at this time travel graph and we take our seismograph and we see that there is a five minute difference between the P wave and the S wave, we find the spot between these two lines where it's five minutes and directly below it on the X axis is going to be our distance from the actual epicenter. With that distance, you draw a circle from where we are, with the radius being the distance to the epicenter, and you make a circle, and then other locations can do the same thing, and where all those circles triangulate, that is where you have the actual epicenter of the earthquake. In this case, of Mexico City, Nome, in New York City, there's your epicenter in central western parts of the United States. So two ways, then, to measure an earthquake, intensity and magnitude. We know the location of the epicenter. The next thing that we're gonna report is the intensity or the magnitude of the earthquake. So intensity is a measure of the amount of ground shaking, and that is based on property damage. And then magnitude is more of a quantitative measure, an actual number we give out of the energy that's released in an earthquake. And that magnitude is something that was developed more recently. One such intensity scale, the modified mortality scale, was developed in California, the original one back in 1902, 
and now it has been modified. Essentially, it's going to be a scale that uses what people feel or what happens to create a scale of 1 to 12. So if an earthquake is not felt, except by very few people, then it's going to get a scale of 1. However, maybe it's felt by nearly everyone, and some people are actually woken up by it. Um, it disturbs trees and poles and other tall objects, then it's going to be given a 5. If you have some slight damage, um, and then you have partial collapse of ordinary buildings and uh, falling chimneys and factory stacks that were up to eight. You start getting some well-built wooden structures destroyed, most masonry and frame structures destroyed, ground badly cracked, you're at a 10. So I think you can get the idea. Basically, this is, is based on what was felt and what actually happened. In here somewhere, sometimes there's actually uh, verbiage about plates falling off of shelves and, and things of that nature. Another intensity scale is one that's been developed recently by the USGS, the US Geologic Service, which is a community internet intensity map. Basically, you know, they have a website, did you feel it, or what did you feel, or how did you feel, or <laughs> something along those lines. Anyway, you go on the website and you tell them what you felt, and they create this map based on the April 23rd earthquake that happened just north of Richmond, that was in 2011, and this was felt over a massive area. People down in South Florida actually were able to call in and let, uh, let the USGS know they felt. But, but consequently, or I should say conversely, this 2004 earthquake, which was 6.0, more energy release than the 5.8, was felt in a much smaller area. Again, the eastern United States has much more solid and rigid rock, and so we feel things further away. The Richter scale is a magnitude scale. It's related to the amplitude of the largest seismic wave. And you use the amplitude of the largest seismic wave and the distance from the epicenter of the earthquake. And you can see on the right where the amplitude is set on the far right graph and the distance is on the left graph. And when you draw a line between the two, then you come up with what the actual magnitude on the Richter scale is. This Richter scale is interesting because it's not a arithmetic increase, meaning from one to two, it's just one unit stronger. It's a logarithmic scale. And so there is a tenfold increase in the wave amplitude that corresponds to a, a, an increase of one on the Richter scale. And that tenfold increase is represented by ground motion. So if you have a magnitude one earthquake, it has 10 times the ground motion of magnitude zero, no shaking. But when you go from one to two, you don't increase the amount of shaking by one, you increase the amount of shaking by 10. So 10 times 10 is 100. When you go from a magnitude two to a magnitude three, the increase is tenfold again, 10 times 100 is 1,000. And then when you go from a magnitude three to a magnitude four, it's a tenfold increase, 10 times 1,000 is 10,000. So you can see how the amount of ground motion increases logarithmically, increases geometrically based on the amplitude of that largest wave on the seismogram. Now, the amount of energy released is at a log 32, which means zero, no energy released. When you go from zero to one, it's 32 times more energy released. One to two, it's 32 times 32, which comes in right around 1,000, and for you know, 1,000 is close enough. And then from two to three, it's 32 times 1,000, or 32,000. And then again, from three to four, we're talking 32 times 32,000, which is somewhere close to a million times more energy released than no earthquake at all. So the Richter scale is a logarithmic scale. And so if you hear about a, a 6.0 earthquake compared to a 7.0, that 7.0 is a tremendous time uh, more ground shaking and energy being released from that 7.0 earthquake. So one last scale that's been developed uh, measures the total energy released based on the amount of slide, the area that actually ruptures, and the strength of the faulted rock. And it's essentially better at estimating the relative size of very large earthquakes.
The Richter scale does not do a great job, not adequate for describing large earthquakes. So this new scale, this moment scale, um, has a, a slightly different, and it's MW is the moment scale. Uh, it's a little bit better at, at estimating these large earthquakes. And this particular table shows us the average number per year at this magnitude. So you can see there's literally over a million earthquakes per year that are below a magnitude of, of very uh, of three, very minor, felt by humans, but no damage. And then there's some 1,300 that are between five and six with moderate earthquakes. And then there's about 15 a year between seven and eight. So there's actually quite a bit of, of energy being released. And when we talk about the energy release is equivalent to kilograms of explosives. You can see where you very, very quickly get up into the millions, tens of millions, and then the billions of kilograms of explosives being released with these massive magnitude seven, eight, and nine earthquakes. So let's talk a little bit about earthquake destruction. I think we probably can all visualize what the destruction of earthquake looks like. Uh, the magnitude and other factors determine the degree of destruction. So it's the magnitude of the earthquake, the type of bedrock, whether it's an unconsolidated sediment, uh, whether you have saturated soils, there's lots of different factors that can determine what type of earthquake damage uh, you end up with. So the area within 20 to 50 kilometers surrounding the epicenter experiences equal shaking. That's pretty typical. And then ground motion diminishes pretty quickly outside of that 50 kilometers. Earthquakes that are in stable interiors, like the interior of the United States, somewhere well away from continental margins, tend to have more rigid and solid bedrock and will be felt over a larger area. And the earthquake damage, as I said, depends on a number of things. The intensity of the earthquake, the magnitude, but also the duration. The Alaska earthquake, 1964, I think lasted for several minutes where the Northridge earthquake uh, in and around LA in the 90s only lasted for about 40 seconds. So the amount of damage, very clearly intensity and duration, the nature of surface materials, the nature of building materials. Buildings in the east have not had any type of modifications made or there's been no type of building codes changed in the east for earthquakes. We're out in California, they've changed those building codes many times. Also, what are the surface materials? If you're on unconsolidated sediment, you may have more shaking than if you're on bedrock. And again, construction practices, as we mentioned, flexible wood and steel reinforced buildings withstand vibrations better. Blocks and bricks generally sustain the most damage in earthquakes. Soft sediments amplify vibrations. Um, vibrations can also cause loosely packed waterlogged materials to behave like a fluid. That's called liquefaction. Essentially, if you have um, a saturated soil, the, the violent shaking can make that saturated soil that may hold up buildings or, or roads turn into a liquid, actually begin to act more like quicksand. And that's liquefaction. That's tremendous amount of damage can come from that. Vibrations create landslides. There's ground subsidence where ground literally sinks. Uh, and of course, uh, fire. And this is an example of what happened in Alaska, some uh, 200 meters, and I think a total of 200 acres of this coastline literally slumped. This is what it looked like before the earthquake. There was a, a weak layer of clay and all these layers above it just slid on it because of the shaking and it just turned it into an absolute mess. Um, the bottom here, it shows you your well-packed soil and that well-packed soil may be on top of more loose, saturated, sandy material, or just some unconsolidated sediment that's saturated. The violent shaking literally causes um, the water in the upper sandy layer to mobilize, and it can force itself through, creating these little small sand volcanoes that we see here. And then all that liquid comes up and out of the supporting layer, and the ground literally settles down and you have subsidence of, of uh, that particular land mass. And so this is a type of liquefaction and this is uh, a, J a Japanese volcano. I think this is also from the 60s where these buildings didn't collapse, they didn't turn to rubble. They literally sank as the soil underneath them liquefied and they just sort of slowly fell over. I mean, not slowly, but they just kind of fell over uh, because of liquefaction.
So mega thrust, those faults that develop where you have subsiding oceanic lithospheric plates subducting underneath continental lithospheric plates, they create that mega thrust fault. Mega thrust displacement lifts large slabs of seafloor. So that mega thrust displacement can cause huge slabs of oceanic crust that have been bound, been, have been bent downward by the subduction zone. When they slip along that mega thrust, that continental plate will actually lift up. And maybe it only lifts up a few meters, but it will lift that amount of seawater up, and that will create a very low amplitude wave that can travel at very high speeds in the open ocean that we know as a tsunami. And of course, when that low amplitude wave reaches shallow water, it becomes a much, much higher wave and uh, tsunamis can be very destructive. Typically those tsunamis, before they arrive, they're preceded by a very rapid withdrawal of water from the beaches and then they're followed by what appears to be a very rapid rise in sea level with a very turbulent surface. Now, tsunamis do not look like regular waves. It's not like a, a wave that you may see at the beach that becomes 40 feet high. It's um, a wave that uh, is just a massive mound of water that moves inland. So let me try and explain what I'm talking about when I talk about that mega thrust situation. So I want to use this little bottom diagram down here. And this is our subducting oceanic plate. So it's moving down. So let's just imagine originally that overriding continental plate looked, looked smoother. And over time, this is, we'll call this T1, and I'll call this down here T2. So over time, that overriding plate was bent downwards. And that is essentially what creates our, our, our trench, our, our subduction trench. So we see a convergent boundary. That is our trench that we see those con uh, convergent boundaries. As this plate is pulled down, it's literally pulled down with the subducting plate, eventually along that, along that mega thrust fault, that's a mega thrust fault right there, the frictional forces that are holding that together, causing this to be pulled down, those frictional forces are overcome, and this plate literally springs back to its original position. It literally springs back to its original position. So all of that ocean water that was here, it gets lifted up, and it travels in both directions, uphill, on land and then out across the open ocean. And that is essentially how a mega thrust plate or mega thrust fault in a convergent plate boundary can create the tsunami. So here is the displacement up. This is the mega thrust fault that places, displaces up and all this water is lifted up and the tsunami washes on shore and then it washes away out into the open ocean. Again, traveling at some 500 miles per hour. So they are amazing. So. An uh, earthquake in the Aleutians can converge on Honolulu in 10 hours. In South America, it can be to Honolulu in 12 hours. In New Guinea, these are all places where there's convergent plate boundaries. It can take 10 hours. So uh, Hawaii is kind of in the bullseye of a number of tsunami possibilities. Um, and they did have a terrible tsunami that wiped out Hilo on the big island of Hawaii. There was no warning whatsoever. Um, so the tsunami warning system was developed back in 1946, and they can typically give a several hour warning before tsunamis arrive. Now we're gonna talk about the Earth's interior. And this is very important because seismic waves give us a very solid understanding of the Earth's interior. The Earth has uh, distinct, three distinct layers, and we say it's density stratified. So the densest, heaviest material, the iron, and some amount of nickel, move to the center of the Earth. So what happened when the Earth was first formed, I want you to imagine just uh, four and a half to five billion years ago when the solar system was forming, the Earth was just a big rock in space that was moving through its, its, its orbit around the sun. And as it moved through its orbit around the sun, it just collected other rocks. Other big rocks were attracted to it because the Earth had gravity, because it was really big. Other rocks were attracted to it. And eventually the Earth just grew into this big, large mass that was homogeneous, it was all the same. Um, but those collisions that were occurring, we call that the heavy bombardment period, the friction from those collisions literally caused the Earth to become partially molten. And as it became partially molten, the heavier 
elements, the iron, the nickels, they got pulled to the center, and that actually created more friction, which created more heat, which created more melting, and that melting caused the lighter materials to be forced to the, to the edge. And essentially, during the heavy bombardment period in the, of the Earth, shortly after it was formed, a homogeneous block of rock, was, it, was, it was spherical, but this chunk of rock became density stratified with the heavier nickels and irons at the core. Of course, this is the solid inner core, solid because of amazing pressure. Even though the heat is tremendous, it's still solid. The liquid outer core, and again, the liquid outer core is very important because it moves around the inner core a little bit faster than the inner core. That creates the magnetic flux that gives us our magnetic fields, which helps protect us from the solar wind, which means that we can still have an atmosphere. And because we have an atmosphere, we can breathe and live. So essentially, without the liquid outer core, we would not have an atmosphere. There is a pretty straight line logic to that. Nonetheless, the, the heavy, the highest density went to the core. Intermediate density is the mantle, and the lowest density is the outside crust. The Earth is, is also uh, dynamic, and as we know, we have lithospheric plates that are diving down, we have magma plumes that are, that are coming up, so material is recycled. Even though this is solid rock, the mantle, it's just hot enough that there is some plastic movement within it. So again, how do we know that the mantle is rock, that the core is iron and nickel, and that the outer core is liquid and the inner core is solid. How do we know that? Well, seismic waves allow us to see what was happening in the interior. Remember, in science, you have to be able to make observations, empirical, empirical evidence. You have to be able to see it. Well, you can't see it, and unless you go down there, you can't see it. The way we are able to see it is through the way seismic waves are reflected and refracted and diffracted. And all waves have these three behaviors. All waves will be refracted through layers. They'll be bent, they'll be turned as they move into higher density or different materials. Um, all waves will be diffracted around objects. It's just like a wave coming toward a headland. If there's a big seamount out maybe 100 yards off the beach, the waves will bend around that seamount. So that's diffraction. And where you have discontinuities, meaning uh, less dense material and denser material, material of one composition, material of a second composition, you'll have waves that are reflected, just the same way waves are reflected off a jetty. And one of the most important things is that our S waves, our secondary waves, or our shear waves, do not move through the liquid core. They do not move through the liquid core. So if this is our earthquake, our focus, our hypocenter, the primary wave is going to move right through that core. It may be bent and diffracted, but it's going to end up on the other side of the Earth where that secondary wave is not. And there's going to be a shadow. So if this is the, the epicenter, there's going to be a shadow from about here to probably over to here where that secondary wave never shows up to seismographs. And it's the fact that we knew the secondary waves couldn't go through liquid that, le that led us to understand that the interior of the Earth, the outer core, is liquid. Back to Earth's layered structure, temperature increased as materials accumulated to form the earth. We talked about that. Iron and nickel melted, sank to the center to produce an iron-rich core. The buoyant rock rose to the surface and gave us a crust rich in oxygen, silica, aluminum, calcium, potassium, magnesium, a little bit of iron as well. The chemical separation led to our iron-rich core and our primitive crust and mantle. And so again, the earth is divided into three compositionally distinct layers. You have your core, which is iron-rich, your mantle, which is intermediate, and your crust, uh, which is uh, more aluminums, oxygen, and silica, right? It can also be divided into zones based on physical properties, such as solid or liquid or strength, where the inner core is solid, the outer core is liquid. The lower mantle is strong, and the upper mantle is weak. The upper mantle, of course, is what makes up the asthenosphere, which is connected to the lithosphere. So the Earth can be divided compositionally and based on its physical properties. First, we'll talk about the Earth's crust, thin and rocky, and divided horizontally, not through depth, but horizontally into the oceanic crust and the continental crust. And there's some details about this that are best understood, at least the general concepts here. The crust under the ocean, or the oceanic crust that is, 
is a thin seven kilometers thick, mainly composed of basalt, and that's important. Basalt is that low silica and also low gas content rock that comes from low silica, low gas content magma that comes up essentially from the asthenosphere. So it has uh, very little silica involved in it, which means it flows nicely and makes these nice, uh, this nice thin oceanic crust, all right? It's also a bit in the dense side, and it's denser certainly than continental crust, but actually a little bit denser than the asthenosphere, which does allow it to dive down and be subducted. Continental crust is clearly uh, five times thicker, five, maybe six times thicker in some cases, uh, and uh, it's 35 to 40 kilometers thick, maybe, and here it is nice and thick over here, and uh, maybe under the Andes and under the Himalayas as much as 70 kilometers thick. And of course, the oceanic crust and the continental crust both ride on the lithosphere, which is plastic, hot and weak. But you can see, like a boat, uh, this is kind of maybe like a, a flat bottom fishing boat. It's sinking down into the lithosphere a little bit, where your deep V hull boat is sinking down uh, into the lithosphere, lithosphere a great deal more. So there's a significant sinking, essentially, and we refer to this as isostatic rebound. The less dense, less heavy oceanic crust doesn't sink as far into the asthenosphere, and the, uh, the, the, the heavier and the thicker continental crust sinks a little bit further down into the asthenosphere. The continental crust is made up of lots of different rock types as opposed to the oceanic, which is mostly basalt, and again, you can see the density is a little bit lower there. Now, next is the mantle, the next layer down, and the mantle begins right at the edge of either the oceanic crust or right at the edge here of the continental crust. That is the edge there, the continental crust. This is the edge here, the oceanic crust. Everything below that is the lithosphere. Even though that strong layer of the mantle is part of the lithospheric plate attached to the crust, it is still part of the mantle. And the mantle, again, is going to be uh, divided into the strong, rigid layer and then the hot, weak layer below, and then everything below about six to 660 kilometers is going to be um, mostly solid rock that just slowly moves in some cases. So between the, the mantle and the crust, there is a chemical change at the boundary. This first 600, 660 kilometers is periodicite, uh, and then the very step upper part of the mantle, this very upper part of the mantle, plus the crust, as we've said before, is known as the lithosphere, and it's cool and it's rigid, and it's the Earth's outer shell, maybe 100 kilometers th thick. The weaker portion below, so that's down here, this weaker portion is known as the asthenosphere, as we've said, uh, and the upper asthenosphere is partially melted, and of course, the upper asthenosphere and the lithosphere, they move independently, which allows that lithospheric plate to move over the asthenosphere. And last, of course, is the core way down here at the bottom. Its density is very, very high, 10 grams per cubic centimeter. The outer core is liquid, as we've talked about, and the outer core being liquid and rotating more quickly around the inner core generates that Earth's, the Earth's magnetic field. And again, just to, to touch base on this a second time, that magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. And the solar wind is just the, the, the sun's solar radiation. Of course, some of that radiation does get through in the form of heat and light ultraviolet rays and also uh, UV rays, ultraviolet and also infrared rays, uh, but not all the sun's radiation hits the earth, strikes the earth. Uh, lots of it's deflected away by the magnetic field, and if we didn't have the magnetic field deflecting that solar wind away, the solar wind would strip away the earth's atmosphere. And so without this magnetic field, no atmosphere, without the liquid outer core, no magnetic field. But again, the core is iron and nickel, and it is quite dense. So as these tectonic plates, as these lithospheric plates move around the globe by each other, at each other, uh, away from each other, they cause the rock along their margins to be pushed on, pulled apart, ground past each other, and all of this leads to deformation, just the, de the deforming of the rocks. All changes in shape, position, or orientation of rock is deformation. Bending and breaking occurs when that stress exceeds the strength. So essentially what it tells us is you can push on a rock and it may remain solid, but when the chemical bonds of that rock are broken or stretched, then you're either going to get bending, and you can see this bending of this rock here. This is what's known as a syncline and then an anticline. 
uh, bending of the rock, or you may get breaking of the rock, which may result in a fracturing or faulting. So when the, the stress exceeds the strength of the rock, you're going to get bending and you're going to get breaking. Elastic deformation is going to be when stress is gradually applied and then rocks return to their original shape and size when the stress is removed. And that's what we talked about with our earthquake, right? The rock is pushed on and pushed on, it's pushed on, it's bent, 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 and finally the frictional forces give way and the rock snaps back into its original shape. Now it may have moved, and that's also deformation, but it's snapped back into its original shape. Ductile or brittle deformation occurs when that elastic limit is, sur is surpassed. So that's a situation where the rock, it bends, it deforms, it deforms, it deforms, and is, instead of snapping back into its original shape, it cracks or breaks. That's brittle deformation. And so the strength of any given rock is influenced by the temperature, the, confi the confining pressure, the rock type, and also time. So different rocks will perform differently under different levels of stress based on those, those functions. All right, brittle deformation is when the chemical bonds are stretched but not broken. It results in fractures um, and it's very common or near the surface. Ductile deformation is a solid state flow that happens at great depths, meaning it produces a change in the size and the shape of the rock. And some of the chemical bonds in that ductile deformation actually break and new bonds are formed. And that's the way the rock can flow or can change its size or its shape you know, because the bonds have been broken enough and that's referred to as the ductile deformation. Folds are wave-like undulations that form when rocks bend under compression and compressional forces result in both shortening and thickening of the crust. So imagine if you have uh, two pieces, uh, a piece of rock being shoved from different sides, it's going to shorten that rock. It's going to make it smaller, but it's also going to make it deeper, make it thicker. And so that's what happens with crust. It's compressional forces shorten and thicken it. And we already sort of showed you uh, the different types of folds that you can have. I'll go back to this slide. You've got your syncline and your anticline and your folds and your faults. So there's a number of different features that develop. Uh, anticlines are upfolded or arch layers. Synclines are associated with downfolds or troughs. Some of these things are symmetrical where both limbs are mirror images. Some are uh, asymmetrical. There are overturned, which is where one or both limbs are actually tilted beyond the vertical. And then there's recumbent folds when they're actually to become horizontal. So in an overturned uh, situation, you can actually get an older rock on top of younger rock, which is very unusual. And same thing when in a recumbent. So lots of different folds that can occur. Here is your anticline. Here is your syncline. Here's your overturned, um, overturned fold. And that's the axis right through here. The axis is straight up and down here. The axis is straight up and down here. One of the things that you have to understand is the limb of this anticline is also the limb of this syncline. And so here's your anticline, here's your syncline. This becomes uh, sort of folded over a little bit and you may get a completely overturned fold uh, in this situation. So rock strata as it's exposed can actually look like this. So if you were to go through this area and uh, dig a big valley between here to put a road through, you might see these types of roads where you've cut that rock away. You, I'm sorry, you might see these types of of uh, rock strata, the anticline of the synclines where you've cut that rock away. You have domes and basins. Uh, this is a situation where um, rock built up. It was literally pushed up and then weaker rock was eroded away from it. So circular or elongated up warping structures are called domes. So some type of pressure caused this to rise up in the vertical, create a dome here and then the stronger rock, the granite, the schist, so your, your uh, igneous and your metamorphic rock uh, stayed put and your, your weaker, your sandstones uh, and probably some uh, limestone in here as well, that is what has eroded away. Um, down warping structures, the exact opposite, are called basins. And then you also have monoclines, which are large step-like folds. A large block of basin rock is displaced upwards and the sedimentary strata just sort of drapes over that fold. And so this is what a, mon a monocline looks like. So this whole thing is a monocline. This is sort of a cutaway of it where you've had um, uh, stepping up and then the sedimentary rock over it 
just sort of folds and just lays over it, kind of like um, sometimes they talk about uh, uh, clothes being laid over a bench. So monoclines, again, are those large step-like folds, large blocks of basement rock are displaced upward. So here's the displacement upward of the basement rock. And the ductile, more ductile, sedimentary strata is sort of just draped over that fold. So that is going to be your, your monocline. Faults are structures formed by brittle deformation, essentially cracks. Faults are fractures in the crust with appreciable displacement. Um, movement parallel to the dips are called dip slip faults. And that's just essentially if you have a crack at an angle, the movement of the, the, the blocks are along that crack. Rock surface above the fault is called the hanging wall block. The surface below the fault is called the foot wall block. And then, of course, sometimes you get these cliffs that are created, and those are called fault scarps. And here is what that looks like. This is a normal fault. It's a normal fault because it's been created by tensional forces. Essentially, um, these two blocks are being pulled away from each other. So these are two blocks that may have had the exact same elevation, but there's a fracture in between them. And there's tensional forces. So that block's being pulled this way. This block's being pulled this way. And as it finally breaks, this block slides down. That block is the one that moved. And that is known as the hanging block wall. This is the, the foot wall. And there is one of those fault scarps that we see right there. And this is a pretty good example uh, of that that you can see uh, with this person. Uh, there is the fault. There's the hanging block wall and the foot wall. And right in here, it's kind of tough to figure, but it, that's where you have your fault scarp. So normal faults. The hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall. So here's a normal fault. The hanging wall is the wall that has moved down, all right? That's a normal fault. Fault block mountains are associated with large normal faults. So you can have fault block mountains when an entire landform in which there's tensional forces, and perhaps there's some upwelling beneath it, but whatever happened, there's tensional forces, and you get, you get cracks, fractures, uh, because of those tensional forces. And as these rocks are pulled apart in this direction, these will stay where they are, but this whole rock will fall down. And it may fall down many hundreds of kilometers, or not kilometers, many hundreds of meters, a couple of kilometers. And what you end up with is a landform that looks something like this, where this becomes a mountain and this becomes a valley. And those are fault block mountains. Those are referred to as fault block mountains. Uplifted blocks are elevated topography called horsts, and down drop blocks are basins called gravens. By the way, horsts and gravens also occur over in Germany, and loosely translated, horse means heap, and graven means grave. Uh, and you can see maybe how they got those names. Tensional forces pull these things apart. The normal fault, the center fault, drops down uh, you get these half gravens where, where you have a deposition of sediments that have eroded from the horse themselves. Uh, and uh, again, this is the basin and range area. Several hundred of these line up. And they're not very tall, maybe 1,500 meters high. And then eventually, this all gets worn down flat as, as erosion moves the sediment down into the valleys. Reverse faults are now the opposite of a normal fault. A reverse fault is compressional. A normal fault is tensional. Blocks of rock being pulled apart. Reverse faults are compressional, where they're being pushed together, called thrust faults sometimes. The hanging wall, in this case, moves up relative to the foot wall. Reverse faults um, that are thrust faults typically have a dip, an angle of less than 45 degrees. Again, they result from compressional stresses, and they accommodate crustal shortening, but also, again, crustal thickening. So uh, here you have your compressional forces. They're pushing these two blocks together and the hanging wall gets forced up over the foot wall. Here's the hanging block, and here's the foot wall block, and it gets forced up, and you get these types of, of uh, landscapes that set up. Reverse faults are dip-slip faults in which the hanging wall block moves up relative to the foot wall block, and that dip-slip just means that this is the fault, and the movement of the blocks is parallel. That's the direction, that's the direction, and it's parallel to the actual fracture. That's what makes it a dip-slip fault. And again, normal is when they pull away from each other and that block slides down, and reverse is when they push toward each other and that block slides up. Joints are cracks in, in rocks that are not faults, fractures with no appreciable displacement. There's no movement. There is the fracture, but there's no movement. They develop in response to regional upwarping or downwarping, just some pressure, 
compressional pressure, perhaps even tensional pressure, you get the cracks. Cracks actually are, are awesome for erosion. They give lots of surface area for erosional agents to, to work and to weather, uh, to weathering agents, uh, and uh, you get much more weathering and therefore erosion when you have those fractures. Mountain building, um, orogenesis or, or uh, mountain building, orogenesis or orogeny is that set of processes that forms a mountain belt. Kind of a small word for such a big thing, but mountain building, orogenesis, older mountain chains tend to be eroded and less topographically prominent. Younger mountain chains, not nearly as eroded. So the Appalachians are older and eroded. The Urals are older and eroded. And the Andes are very, very young. Most mountain chains, uh, we saw that you can have horse engravings that occur from tensional forces. Um, but most mountain chains, the building up of mountains, come from compressional forces like you see here. Large quantities of pre-existing sedimentary and crystalline rock, igneous rock, that have been folded and faulted and lifted up. Again, compressional forces may shorten the crust, make it smaller horizontally, but they tend to thicken the crust, as you can see here. So your young mountain belts um, along the west coast of North and South America, the Alps, um, the, uh, the Himalayas, and then your old mountain belts, the Appalachians, the Urals, uh, the Caledonian belt there uh, in Norway. Um, and then you have things that are called shields, which are just uh, flat areas and platforms, which are shields covered by sedimentary rocks. And so the earth is covered by some very specific landforms that have created by a very specific uh, situation. So your, your compressional forces of the Pacific plate and the North American plate and the Nazca plate and the South American plate creating this young mountain range, the compressional forces of Africa and Eurasia or the, the Europe, European plate, part of the Eurasian plate, Africa moving up into it, that's compressional forces here. The Mediterranean Sea is closing. Um, you also have India obviously slamming into Eurasia, creating the Himalayas and the entire Tibetan uplift. And then some of the uh, uh, some of the crust that was squeezed out of this has actually come over here and helped to create southern parts of Asia and even down into Indonesia. All right, subduction and mountain building, they go hand in hand. Subduction of oceanic lithospheric, uh, or lithosphere, or lithospheric plates, is the driving force in mountain building, volcanic island arcs, and then also continental volcanic arcs form from the subduction of either oceanic crust underneath oceanic crust, which gives you a volcanic island arc, or oceanic crust under continental crust, which gives you a continental volcanic art, arc. Uh, and typically, your continental volcanic arcs are going to be occurring at the continental margin. But we've talked a lot about tectonics and the overall uh, events that occur when one plate subducts underneath another. I think it's worth at least going over in general terms one more time. You have a continental lithosphere plate. So this is the lithosphere here to here. That's the, that's the lithosphere there. And then you have the oceanic lithosphere plate right here. And again, both those plates are a combination of both crust and mantle. In this case, crust and mantle. And they are moving toward each other. This is our motion. They're moving toward each other. Um, I'll draw this arrow down here. The oceanic lithosphere is more dense. It weighs more. It's more dense. And so it gets subducted underneath the continental lithosphere. Um, stuff gets scraped off, uh, sediments and maybe old islands. Things are just uh, with low enough density. They don't get subducted. They get scraped off. This is called an accretionary wedge. At about 100 kilometers down, the water become, becomes forced out, or the water begins to be forced out of this lithospheric plate. That causes partial melting, all right? So you get igneous, where you get magma that forms, and the magma pushes up sort of, the magma tends to gather right at that, that uh, boundary between the, um, the, the crust and the mantle. And then when it gets enough of it, it gets hot enough, it forces its way up into the actual continental crust, sometimes breaking out to create volcanoes, lots of times just creating these uh, plutonic emplacements and thickening that crust. Meanwhile, this continues to occur and more and more um, magmatic material pushes up 
and you end up getting your continental volcanic arc. And again, it looks similar when it's two ocean plates colliding. It's just that instead of this, this whole process occurring in a continental margin, it's occurring in an oceanic plate and you get volcanic islands that form. So again, subduction of oceanic lithosphere is that driving force in mountain building. And here is exactly that, two oceanic plates moving toward one another. The one that's older and therefore colder is slightly more dense, it subducts. There's your mantle wedge, dewatering forces that and your magma flows up. And it's magma that's largely coming from the mantle and so as it flows up, that mantle creates nice basaltic lava flows that give you our shield volcanoes, which we're going to talk about in chapter seven. And you get an, an island arc, all right? Now, if these two are still moving toward each other, eventually all this land ends up, North America ends up here, and this, this island arc will get scraped off on North America. And the same thing happens over here. This is another island arc that's grown together as a microcontinent, very much like Japan. Japan is just a bunch of volcanic islands that were big enough, the volcanoes are big enough that it grew into one big gigantic island. And as this plate motion continues, eventually this is all going to get scraped off. This is moving separately, but eventually this is going to collide over here with North America. This whole plate will get subducted and under. This will collide with North America. So this island arc will first be here, all right? And then eventually that island arc will be here. And so North America will be elongated, it will be much larger with these these uh, island arcs and microcontinents, and eventually Africa is going to come in and connect with the entire thing. And that is literally what happened with the closing of Pangaea. Not the separation of Pangaea, the closing of Pangaea, but I just wanted you to see how volcanic island arcs can be built um, with oceanic lithosphere subducting underneath other oceanic lithosphere. Continental volcanic arcs form at like mountains that are much like the Andes. It's using andesitic magma. It's magma that's not all uh, low silica. It's got some silica in it. And you get these, um, these Andes type convergent zones. So again, we sort of walk this through before subduction, sediment accumulates on that, on that passive margin. And then when it becomes active, that sediment gets scraped off. This is now active. That sediment gets scraped off to create that, um, that, uh, accretionary wedge, and eventually that accretionary wedge will literally get pushed up onto this, this continent, and the distance between the, the volcanic arc and the actual sea will get, will get larger. You'll actually widen that continent at that, at that location. So here is the A, B, and C of mountain building. This is a passive margin, completely passive. This continental lithosphere and this oceanic lithosphere are sutured together. They're both moving in the same direction. And uh, weathering and erosion and deposition of sediment creates this nice thick layer, which we call the continental shelf of sediment, all right? Then a change occurs, and now we start to get this oceanic plate subducting underneath that lithospheric plate. And all this sediment, this whole continental shelf gets smushed and wedged and compressed and deformed and metamorphized in some cases, and that is your accretionary wedge. That's the formation of your accretionary wedge, and what used to be kind of a flat plane now gets a the beginnings of a volcanic island arc. Eventually, that whole accretionary wedge gets sort of shoved onto that continental basin. Again, now you've widened that continental margin out significantly. This is where it was initially, which is about right here. Now you've pushed all that sediment on there. It's been folded and deformed, and it creates what would be a coastal range with the main range of batholiths, which is those big granitic emplacements, uh, being a further back to the, well, in this case, if this is North America, back to the east. Cordilleran-type mountain building occurs in like the Pacific Basin, particularly here in North America on up into Alaska. And you have very rapid seafloor spreading going on, and so you have very rapid subduction. You get island arcs and crustal fragments, which we're going to call terrains, will collide with what used to be the old continent, and you get all this additional material that is essentially stuck onto the west coast of North America. Some of the smaller terrains are subducted, 
but some frames are big enough to be considered microcontinents and they just get stuck to the side of it. And so those larger trains get literally thrust up. So looking at what we know, this was the western edge of North America and plate tectonics has allowed this entire accretion of new material. And in that time frame, you've also had some mountain building that's gone on, but all this new material has been added to the west side of North America. And again, we've sort of gone through this once. Uh, you may have a, an oceanic plate that has both an island arc, maybe inactive, it's no longer got um, any subduction going on. There's no longer a hot spot there. There's no longer mountain building or volcanoes being built. And then an old microcontinent, and that whole, that whole plate is moving towards some continental crust. And first, some of those islands get subducted under, but, but many of those islands are going to be just sort of stuck on the side of this continent. And then eventually, so we go A here, right? And so here comes our continental crust. Our island arc gets accreted to the continental slope. This is B down here. And here comes our microcontinent. And eventually, um, our microcontinent creates a new subduction zone, which is a little bit further away, oceanward, and a new trench oceanward of the continent. And eventually, that whole microcontinent gets stuck on there. And, and again, once again, what this essentially means is this continental margin is increased from about here way over to here. It, it gets much larger, and that's what happened with North America. So um, alpine type orogenies are a little bit different. In an alpine type orogeny, what you had initially was a subducting oceanic tectonic plate underneath a continental tectonic plate. But suture two on a passive margin way back here is more continental tectonic, uh, more continental lithosphere. So this is oceanic lithosphere, this is continental lithosphere. And as this whole process occurs, this sea gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And eventually this continental lithosphere collides with this continental, continental lithosphere and it creates warping and uplift that results in alpine type of mountains, very much like the, the Himalayas. And just one last little piece of this scenario is that the continental crust of the Indian Australian plate actually moved up and under the Eurasian plate and lifted this whole area up in that Tibetan plateau, very high elevation Tibetan plateau, where I think the average elevation of the Tibetan plateau is as high as our highest point in North America. And this is what the Appalachian orogeny looked like. And this is how, this is the closing of a sea that existed before Pangaea. And this is the creation of Pangaea. So we had North America, we had this volcanic island arc that was called uh, the Taconic Island Arc. We had Avalonia, which is a microcontinent. And both the island arc and the microcontinent were formed when oceanic lithospheric plates or a oceanic lithospheric plate subducted under another oceanic lithospheric plate. And you got an island arc. And Avalonia was just an island arc that got big enough to become a microcontinent. But Africa and North America were moving toward each other. And ultimately, the Taconic orogeny occurred when, when North America caught up to that island arc the rest of the plate got subducted under, and you got your first little orogeny. And then Avalonia eventually got smushed in there as well. And as Avalonia got sutured to North America, that was the Acadian orogeny, a whole different period of mountain building, all right? And then Africa, that old ancestral Atlantic, got squished together and disappeared, and Africa caught up. And the two joined together, and then you got more mountain building from crustal deformation. And what you essentially ended up with was this is Pangaea. And what are the Appalachian Mountains are kind of somewhere in the middle of Pangaea. And the last step in this whole process is Pangaea was around for maybe 50 million years. And then some magma plume rose up underneath Pangaea. And it didn't rise up right here to split this back in two. It rose up somewhere over here. And what happened is the edge of Africa and, and all of this began to move away and Africa went one direction and all of this began to move away. So there's actually this little chunk of, of continental crust, which is used to be Africa, is right here up underneath 
the south and eastern edge of North America as they began to move away and the new North Atlantic developed. And our basement rock, well, the basement rock underneath Florida is that same basement rock that was a remnant of Africa. And so you have the Appalachians over here, you get the Blue Ridge Mountains and the coastal plain that we have today that really all formed in this Alleghenian orogeny that helped to create Pangaea. And that is going to kind of wrap up what is a very, very large concept or a very, very large subject matter, and that is mountain building. And as geologists have been able to study rocks in different places and piece together the geologic history of mountain building and continents and subcontinents and microcontinents and island arcs and supercontinents growing together and splitting apart, it's really a fascinating study of historical geology and something which is very much worth giving a lot more attention to. That was Chapter 6 of Foundations of Earth Science, the 8th edition, written by Lutkins and Tarbuck from Pearson Education. Again, we are in an introduction to earth science, and we're getting well into the course now. Six chapters down, ten more to go. Coming up next in Chapter 7, we're looking at volcanoes and other igneous activity. And of course, this is all, again, a function of plate tectonics. So we will see you for Chapter 7.